Welcome to the Revival Animal Health webinar on parasites in dogs. Today we're talking about the external parasites such as fleas, ticks, mites, lice, and all, so many more. My name is Shelly. I'm the content manager at Revival Animal Health. And today we have Dr. Marty Greer, Revival's Director of Veterinary Services, joining us. Dr. Greer has more than 40 years experience in veterinary medicine, so she knows everything about parasites. So take it away, Dr. Greer. Well, I probably don't know everything, but I do like parasites. It's my favorite class as a veterinary student, and I still stay in touch with my parasitology instructor at Iowa State, who is um, retired now, because uh, that was a long time ago. So we're going to talk about fleas, ticks, lice, mites as our primary focus today. So we do have on our website, the Revival Animal Health website, this really cool flea and tick finder key that can be very useful for you. All you have to do is um, use this image with your phone, and this will take you directly to that. This uh, is also in the notes. So if you don't have access to your phone right this second or you're afraid you're going to lose track of where we are, um, please don't hesitate to go in here later. What the tick and flea finder um, application on our website does is it helps you based on whether you have a male or female dog, a dog or a cat, a dog that's pregnant or not, the age, all those important things that we make decisions on what products are best. Um, it goes through and walks you through an algorithm that helps you select the best product. So you're not gonna be on your own completely making these decisions. So for our external parasites today, we're gonna talk about parasite appearance, life cycle, the importance of each parasite, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So I think it's important that we kind of do all this as a comparison and the, the notes actually have this in a chart, um, which makes it pretty easy for you to follow when you're going through um, figuring out what, what you see on your pet, what that little critter is and what we need to do about it. So the flea, and this is a very attractive flea here, it's quite cute looking in this picture, um, except for the one with its teeth bared. Um, this is pretty much what a flea looks like if you were able to see it um, with some magnification. They're reddish brown in color. They don't have wings. And this is a really important distinction because if I have somebody that calls and says, well, there's something flying around my house, it may be some other kind of a bug, but it's not a flea. Fleas don't come with wings. They're flattened side to side. So unlike a tick, which is flat top to bottom, a flea is flat side to side which allows it to dart between the hairs really quickly on your dog or your cat or on you if it ends up on you. Um, so it's super important that you know that they do jump, but they do not fly. They don't have wings. They're reddish brown in color. Um, they move really quickly. The easiest place to see them is usually on the unhaired part of the tummy, the belly where the dog or cat doesn't have as much hair. Sometimes on cats right up by their ears where there's a little patch of less hair up there is where we'll see them as well. Um, but they, they will be found um, frequently on the dogs. Now, the adult flea looks like this picture on the right-hand side. You can see it's reddish brown. It, you know, it's got six legs, it's flat. Um, the picture on the left-hand side is the pupa. So when fleas go through their life cycle, they lay an egg, which turns into a pupa, which turns into a nymph, which turns into an adult flea. And then we have the whole life cycle starting over again. So here again is the the elements of the life cycle is an adult flea and fleas need to take a blood meal to um, lay eggs. So the female flea will take a blood meal. She'll mate with the male. She'll produce eggs. The eggs are laid. They'll be in the environment, sometimes on the pet's skin. Sometimes they roll off and end up in your carpet or your furniture. Um, those two days to two weeks later will turn into larva. Larva will then um, live in the carpet, the furniture, that kind of stuff. Um, for another five to 14 days, they turn into a pupa, which is a baby flea. And then a week to several months later, they turn into an adult flea. Now the life cycle can take as little as three weeks, depending on what the environment is, how hot it is in your house, how cold it is in your house, what the humidity is. Um, and it can take longer if there isn't anything alive in your house. Like if there's a house that's vacant for a period of time, those fleas can stay really pretty dormant, just hanging around waiting for something that moves, something with carbon dioxide, something with heat. And if you move or walk into a house that's been empty for a while, those fleas are gonna reactivate and they're gonna come out in full force. And if there's not a dog in the house, you're gonna be their next meal. So it's not all that much fun to come into a house where fleas have become dormant. 
So optimal com conditions are between 70 and 85 degrees at 70% humidity. So as you can see from this, certain climates of the United States have better conditions for fleas than others. We're in Wisconsin, Shelley's in Iowa. Um, it's cold there in the wintertime. It's cold, it's dry. We don't have as much of a problem in the wintertime as we do in other parts of the country. If you live in the southern tier of states, Florida, Texas, where it's hot and humid, fleas are a huge issue. Like all the dogs and cats are gonna have fleas unless we do something about flea and tick control. So very important that we're aware that these environmental conditions are key to keeping the life cycle going. A female adult flea can lay up to 50 eggs a day and 2000 eggs in two months. So that's a little scary. Um, and fleas will take blood meals, as you can see in this picture, off of dogs and cats, but off other rodents, other little warm blooded animals, and off of humans as well. Uh, they are super common. We see them in all climates. The time we see them the most in our northern tier of state climates, the time we find them in the house the most is in October, right about the time that the weather starts to get cold. As it starts to cool off in um, late September, October, and November, the fleas are that are living outside on the rabbits and the little other creatures that live in your yard are like, you know, it's getting a little chilly out here. So they hop onto your dog. And that's when we tend to see the biggest problems in the Northern states is during the fall, but they can be all year round in many places. And they're not just icky little creatures. They also spread important diseases like tularemia. They spread tapeworms from dog to dog um, and from dog to other species. So if you wanna go back and look at the tapeworm segment, we did that. Um, previously on the video that was recorded in January. Um, control and treatment are required year round in most climates. And that's gonna be things like frontline, which is a topical, Brevecta, which is an oral, and Selamectin, which is in Revolution, another topical product. What kind of symptoms do we see? We can see the dogs or cats scratching obsessively, chewing, especially at the base of the tail. Fleas on dogs and cats tend to hang out in the highest numbers around the base of the tail. So if you're looking for them, um, you're gonna see, it's easier to see them on the belly, but there are gonna be more of them around the, the top of the tail, the rump. Uh, when you look down against the coat, sometimes you'll see the fleas, sometimes you'll see flea dirt. Flea dirt is flea poop. And that's actually also called flea frass. And that's where the blood meal, the um, female flea takes the blood meal and then she passes that blood. And we'll show you what a picture of that looks like. An allergic dog, a dog that's allergic to fleas will be itchy everywhere. A dog that only has fleas, but doesn't have a flea allergy will be uncomfortable, but not nearly to the same degree as the flea allergic dogs. <clears throat> like I said, humans can get flea bites as well. <clears throat> These are pictures that I took off the internet. Fortunately, I've not had these, but my father-in-law used to have um, every fall, he would say he broke out in this weird rash. Well, as it turned out, his wife had, um, his first wife had a number of cats and um, those cats would have fleas. And again, they became a problem in the fall. So once we got rid of the fleas on the cats, his rash went away. So if you are seeing some rashy kind of lesions that might be itchy, this is something to talk to your dermatologist, your physician about. Um, please keep your clothes on when you go to your veterinary clinic. We don't need to see your skin. Um, you'd be surprised how many people want to show us their skin lesions. So please stay dressed. Um, you might just pull up your pant leg a wee bit, but try to try to not show us the rest of your body. Um, flea frass looks like this. Like I said, flea dirt or flea poop um, is called frass. And if we comb through the coat and we don't see a flea, but we see these little black specks, they kind of look like dirt, but they're not quite dirt because when you put them on a wet gauze or a wet paper towel, they turn into blood because the blood meal that the flea took then passes out. And if we rehydrate it, it turns into this blood. So it becomes pretty evident that that's frass and that's from actual fleas living actively on the pet. So if you're finding flea dirt or flea frass, this is how to tell the difference between dirt dirt, like the kind that is out in your lawn and flea dirt. So important distinction. How do we get rid of fleas on the dog? The fastest kill is gonna be Capstar. It's an oral product that contains nicotinamide. Within an hour, you're gonna have fleas dropping off the dog pretty quickly, but that only lasts about 24 hours. So it does a great job of knocking the flea numbers down, but it's not gonna give you the prolonged kill that you need to, to interrupt that life cycle of the flea. Because remember, we showed the picture of that, and those fleas are gonna to continue to um, have eggs that hatch out into larva and into pupa and then come back in into adult fleas. So unless you're retreating every three to four weeks, you're gonna have those fleas hatching out again and again and again, and you're gonna be really frustrated. 
Um, Frontline is a topical over-the-counter product that does a great job on fleet control. Revolution is a prescription item. Again, it's topical. It's called Selamectin. Um, it is similar to Ivermectin, which is one of the uh, mectins that we see that does do a good job with parasite control. It is labeled to get rid of fleas, ticks, ear mites, um, prevent heartworm disease, and to treat scabies. Um, this is a product that is safe for dogs that are in a breeding program, dogs that are pregnant, and puppies that are over six weeks of age. Brevecto is the oral tablet. Now, there are four oral flea and tick medications on the market. There is Credelio, Nexgard, Simperica, and Brevecto. Credelio, Nexgard, and Simperica have not been tested in breeding animals. Brevecto has been and found to be safe. So remember, a breeding dog is a breeding dog. And I say this over and over again. And every time I say it, somebody still looks at me and goes, oh, oh. So a six week old male puppy that you're planning on keeping as a, your next stud dog is a breeding dog. He's not pregnant. He will never be pregnant. When he's two years old and he starts producing sperm, we want him to have sperm. And we don't know what Fridelio, Nexgard, and um, Simperica are going to do to male dogs in a breeding program or female dogs in a breeding program, pregnant or not. So Advantage and Advantix are not tested. Vectra is not safe. Seresto is the collar. It is not tested and labeled as safe in the United States. So it's really important that you are looking at the label of your products and this is all laid out in your handout, but you as a consumer can either talk to your vet which may or may not be paying attention to the nuances of these drugs. If 95% of the patients that they see in their veterinary clinic are not in breeding programs, they may not think about this as being important. So you can look to your veterinary professional, you can look online and if you Google search, you type in the Google for the name of the product and then product insert, it'll show the product insert and under reproductive and uh, nursing safety, it'll give you the information, tested, not tested. Some of them simply say, check with your veterinarian. Well, if they haven't tested it, I'm not gonna tell you to use it. The products that I'm telling you here, Frontline Revolution, Brevecto are tested and we know are safe in breeding animals. So stick to the ones we know are safe. Don't go off the rails. And if you do, and you end up with a problem with pregnancy or with fertility, I want you to think hard about the fact that you need to follow label directions and you don't have to be a veterinary professional to Google search those product inserts. So type in the word you're looking for, type in product insert, and then you have to make it big enough on your computer because the font is like negative 12. So you have to make it big enough on your computer to read it, but you can find that information on the product inserts of all the products. So you need to make sure you're using a safe product. The other thing with fleas you need to do is treat the environment. So anything that's a soft surface like carpeting or furniture, you can vacuum. Um, make sure you throw out the vacuum cleaner bag so that the flea eggs and the flea larvae are not living in the vacuum cleaner bag till the next time you turn it on. Um, you can put things that you can't launder into the clothes dryer. So if you have cushions on your couch like pillows and you need to get um, some, some way to treat those pillows, you can throw them in your clothes dryer. Um, and then you can also do um, sprays in the house um, that kill fleas and you can do uh, sprays that include IGRs, which are insect growth regulators. So those are products that will help get rid of the fleas. Now, the primary problem is that the fleas don't entirely live on the dog. So getting the dog onto a flea prevention will get rid of that part of the life cycle, but the fleas will still bite you. They'll still bite other species and they can still perpetuate. So one of the reasons we see treatment failures in fleas is that if you have say 10 dogs and two cats, and you treat the dogs, but not the cats, the cats are gonna perpetuate that life cycle. So all the pets in the environment of that dog need to be treated. You can't just treat a few of them and expect that the flea problem is gonna go away. So prevention is the same as treatment for fleas, revolution, which is Selamectin, Brevecto, um, will work, Frontline will work. And the nice thing about um, Brevecto, which is different than the topicals, Revolution and Frontline, is that you get nose to tail protection, including the feet and the tail. And we know some of the topicals don't get well distributed to the extremities. So the tail and the feet where um, the product doesn't get into quite as well, doesn't do as good a job as the oral product Brevecto in getting rid of the flea life cycle stages. So remember all that. Um, prevention, again, in the environment, sprays, powders. Um, some people use guinea fowl to get rid of fleas and ticks. Those are a form of poultry. And then vacuuming and doing the laundry. All those are really important in flea control. So that's fleas. Ticks are our next exciting topic. Ticks are flat top to bottom. 
not side to side. Again, they don't have wings. Um, and they come in a couple of different versions. You can see that some of them can be pretty small as compared to this one cent piece here. Um, and sometimes it does require magnification. I have people come in all the time. I had a lady yesterday that said, oh, I thought my dog had a little wart on her and then I pulled it off and I realized it was a tick. So they are really a time bomb. Like fleas, they are not just icky, they carry disease as well. So it's very important that we're aware of that. Now, tick appearances can be variable. Um, there's the, uh, Deer tick, which we see most in the upper Midwest and in the um, East Coast areas as causing Lyme disease. So it's a very significant tick in our um, veterinary clinic and the kind of things that we need to control. We see the brown dog tick. We can see the lone star tick. Um, so there's a number of different versions of ticks. There's the lone star tick now, it's harder to kill. So the products that are used um, like Brevecto that say 12 weeks on it for most ticks are eight week intervals for the lone star tick. And again, Lone star ticks are mostly in the southern tier of states, more in the Texas area, thus the name lone star tick. But we can see them in other parts of the country as well. And as, as climate change has occurred, we've seen these ticks moving uh, further out and further out. Now, the last tick, um, which is the most recent um, new tick in town, there's a new tick in town, is the Asian longhorn tick. And that tick has just moved into the United States fairly recently. It came in on livestock, probably sheep or cattle. Um, it came out in the East Coast. So we primarily have seen it on the East Coast. I have not seen one in Wisconsin yet, but it is also in the Southern tier of states as well. So if you're pulling ticks off and you're wondering what this thing is, because it doesn't look like all the other ticks, you might want to look up the Asian longhorn tick. The scary part about the Asian longhorn tick is that it does not need to mate to produce baby ticks. All these other ticks are like fleas, they need a blood meal and they need a mate, but the Asian longhorn tick can replicate without um, a male. So again, we have the life cycle of the adult tick um, that takes a blood meal after it's attached for 24 or more hours. Um, the egg, they lay eggs, the eggs fall off into the environment, the um, eggs hatch out, they form into uh, larva, then into nymphs and then attach again. Now, most people think that ticks are only a problem in parts of the country where it's warm all the time. Um, in Wisconsin, we actually see most of our tick problems in January and February when we get a nice 40 degree day. Um, it warms up a little bit. The ticks have been waiting the whole winter for something to come along and feast on. They sit on the ends of blades of grass doing this little thing with their front little legs called questing and they'll feel the movement, they'll feel the carbon dioxide, they'll feel the heat and they'll um, transmit from that piece of vegetation onto your pet or onto you. So be aware that January and February are months that you still need to do your tick control. Um, the same with fleas. If your dog goes out in the yard and rolls around on a bunny that died in your yard in January, I don't care if there's snow on the ground. If your dog goes out there and picks up ticks or fleas, you're gonna have them in your environment. So this is a product, these products should be used year round. You get better control if you're using it every 12 weeks, if it's a 12 week product, if you're using it every four weeks, if it's a four week product. So don't let your coverage on those products lapse or you're gonna end up with problems again. So what is the importance of ticks? They are common in all climates, Minnesota, Northeast Wisconsin, um, but, Mostly the, the deer tick is in those areas. They bite humans and dogs, they bite other species as well. And the big concern, like we said with fleas, is that they spread disease. They spread different diseases than fleas. They spread Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and Ehrlichia. Um, we probably don't identify every single disease that's spread by ticks. We know Rocky, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a concern. And there are some researchers that have done some pretty great informational research that shows that some of the bloodborne diseases that we see in people and in dogs um, may be related to ticks and tick-borne diseases. So it's a little bit scary to think that it's a possibility that some forms of cancer, not, not all forms of cancer, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, but some of the um, bone marrow cancers may have a relationship with tick-borne diseases. So ticks are very important to control. They're not just icky to find walking around in your clothing. They're not just a key to find attached to you, but they spread some pretty serious diseases. And we know in people, sometimes Lyme disease can become a really chronic disease, hard to diagnose, hard to eliminate, and it happens in our dogs too. Um, control requires, like I said, year-round treatment. So please don't skimp on it. Please use your frontline Brevecto and Celemectin year-round. 
This is a map um, put up by CAPSI. CAPSI Vet is a really great website. You can go in here. You don't, again, have to be a veterinary professional. So you go to capsivet.org. And again, this is a, a link in your notes so that you can go read about it. But this map shows the distribution of Lyme disease. And it's important to know that they're tracking where Lyme disease shows up in dogs because we report that to the company. And that helps us to know where Lyme disease in people is going to show up as well. If we find out that the Asian long-haired tick spreads disease, we're gonna find that out because we're gonna be tracking these things. So you can see what the distribution is. Now this map uh, on capsivet.org, you can go in for heartworm, fleas, ticks, um, Lyme disease. You can put in a number of different um, parameters on what disease you're looking to see, what species you're looking at it in. And what's really cool about it is you can keep clicking on these maps until you get down to your county level. So you know what's going on in your neighborhood from these maps. So very good information, really great. Um, I didn't put all the maps up because you're all capable of figuring out um, where what uh, county you wanna look at. I can't show them all. Tick symptoms are typically um, the bite of the tick, which in a dog can last for an extended period of time. It can take three weeks or more for the tick bite to resolve. We don't see um, a target lesion with Lyme disease on the skin of dogs like we do in people. But again, the most significant tick-borne diseases that we diagnose and see are gonna be Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, and anaplasmosis. There's also Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Tularemia, Hepatozoan, Babesia, and probably others that aren't even diagnosable right now. There's probably diseases that when more tests are developed, we're going to find out that more diseases are caused by tick-borne diseases. The diagnosis may, is made on seeing the tip. And these ticks can be really hard to see. You can see on this person's finger how tiny these are. So if it's in the middle of your back or you think it's a mole or your dog has a brown coat, I mean, I used to have a chocolate lab, finding a brown tick on a chocolate lab is pretty darn impossible. So you can't find every single tick. Um, the, the nymphs are almost translucent when they're baby ticks. So it can be really hard to find. The disease spread that we diagnose are beginning to be diagnosed on blood tests. So there are tests that can be done in your veterinary clinic and at the reference labs to check for anaplasmosis, Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Babesia, all those things. Um, Many veterinary clinics run these in-house. If the SNAP4DX test comes back positive, then there's a confirmatory test called a C6, and that gives you basically a titer. If it comes back less than 30, we know that that dog is, does not have an active infection, even though they might have a positive Lyme test. But if it comes back higher than that, then we're gonna be chasing that down, making sure that that dog's on appropriate antibiotics, doxycycline, to reduce the risk that they develop Lyme disease in a chronic form. Um, we had a dog, last year that tested over 800 on her C6. So those are pretty significant findings. Um, last May, we lost three Labradors to Lyme nephritis, kidney failure, secondary to Lyme disease, all in May, and had one golden retriever that was sick from it, um, did not lose her. But that's a pretty devastating way to go. Um, the other things that we do to test for things like anaplasmosis and Ehrlichia are a complete blood count, a CBC, to look at the platelet and the red blood cell numbers. And dogs that are sick with any of these tick-borne diseases will often have lameness and fever. Many of these dogs have dual and triple infections. You may find that they're positive to two or three of the tick-borne diseases. And I have clients all the time that are like, well, I don't have ticks. I don't ever find ticks. I don't need to use these products. And then their dog comes back positive for one, two, or three of these diseases. Clearly, they have ticks. You can live in town and still have ticks. I see deer walking through the front yards of people's homes in subdivisions. So don't assume that you don't have ticks just because you haven't found one. They're out there and they're pretty prevalent. Treatment for the ticks is, well, you can remove it and the tick key works really well. There are other devices on the market as well that slides over the tick and then can remove it without squeezing the tick's body. You don't wanna do this barehanded and you don't wanna squeeze the tick's body because basically what you do, if you don't appropriately remove the tick, I don't worry about leaving the head behind. You're not gonna do that. The head comes out. What gets left behind is the saliva of the tick that causes inflammation. But what you don't wanna do is squeeze the tick's body because basically you've just injected Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, Ehrlichia, Rocky mountain spotted fever, whatever, right into the dog's circulation. So be very careful when you're pulling the tick off. Prevention and treatment are the same. Revolution, Selamectin, Frontline, Brevecto, and lawn care. It's pretty hard to spray to get rid of all the ticks, but if you can keep the grass trimmed and the trees trimmed, that helps. 
Ticks don't fly, they don't fall out of trees, they're on long vegetation. Um, people can often wear clothing that has DEET impregnated into it. They can use tick control products as well. Um, obviously people aren't going to be using Revolution Frontline and Brevecto on themselves, but they are on their dogs. Um, so treatment and prevention are basically the same thing. And again, guinea fowl, if you wanna um, really annoy your neighbors, get some guinea fowl. Um, some of those hens and they're, they're really quite loud, but they do a good job with tick control. Next will be lice. So lice come in two versions, chewing and sucking. Now lice are not nearly as common as fleas and ticks, but we do have to mention them to be complete. Chewing lice have a broad head, sucking lice have a, a sucking head. It's narrow and they can drill into the skin. Um, either way, they're kind of annoying little creatures. Most people associate them with poor hygiene, but unfortunately um, they happen um, more often than we'd like. Uh, they do live their whole life on the pet. So the uh, louse attaches to the dog, um, walks around and either bites it or chews on it. They lay eggs, the eggs attach to the hair, and then they hatch out into a nymph and then they turn into an adult. Now, what's really important about lice is that human lice cannot live on dogs and dog lice cannot live on humans. So it's very specific to the species. Uh, what kind what kind of a parasite you have. So if your child comes home from school with head lice, you need to treat your kids, you need to treat yourself, but you don't need to treat the dog or the cats because they don't get lice from our kids. And if you find, um, there was a story that was told to us in veterinary school about someone who came in uh, with their um, bird and it had lice, but it was really human lice, but it wasn't really... Um, so it's a little confusing, but human louse is human louse and dog louse is dog louse and bird louse is bird louse. So lice are very species specific. So yes, scratching, biting, and licking, chewing it on the neck. Hair loss can be visible. Um, the lice are visible to the naked eye. Sometimes it requires magnification to see them well. Um, and they, these are what knits look like. So the knit is actually the louse egg and it glues to the hair of the pet. Um, this is a rabbit, but it glues to the hair of the pet. And you can see it's much more easy to see on a dark skin or dark coat than it is on a light coat. So when people talk about picking knits, this is what a knit really is. So knit picking is pulling these little knits off. Treatment is the same as for fleas, frontline revolution. Um, permethrins are good, but not during pregnancy and lactation. Um, Again, the Soresto and Advantage products not labeled for pregnancy and lactation. And if you do have knits like this on the coat, rinsing after a bath with vinegar will help loosen those knits and get rid of those. Um, short of shaving the dog or the cat, you're not gonna get rid of the knits. So the vinegar will help quite a bit in loosening those up. Next, we have ear mites. And again, ear mites are a lot more common than lice, but we need to be systematic about this. So ear mites are mites that live in the ear. We can see different kinds of mites. There are ear mites, scabies mites, demodex mites, and chylidiella mites. Um, each of these are pictured here. The top left corner is the ear mite. The top right corner is the scabies mite. The bottom left corner is the demodex, and the bottom right is the chylidiella mite. Um, all of them require magnification to see so that you can actually see what they are doing. Um, ear mites really prefer living in cat's ears. Rarely do we see them in a dog's ear. They might start off in a dog's ear and set up housekeeping there and very quickly the environment changes in the ear of the dog. So the mites tend to move out, but they will live in a cat's ears for decades. So they really like cat ears. Again, the life cycle is pretty similar. They have an adult, they mate, they lay eggs, they hatch out, and then you have more. So typically it's about a three, week, three to four week life cycle on all of these creatures. The importance is in that dogs that have it probably were in contact with cats that have it. Um, and these rarely can be zoonotic, meaning they will really, really, really rarely live in a human's ear. I've fortunately never had ear mites. Um, I'm around them a lot, so not unusual. Symptoms are typically scratching at the ears, brown discharge, and in dogs, it's gonna look just like a yeast infection. So it's a little bit hard to tell that it's different. So that's why I think a lot of people think their dogs have ear mites is if they see this brown discharge and if they saw brown discharge in their cat's ear, they assume it looks the same in a dog's ear and that's not true. Um, typically those are yeast infections in the dog's ears. In the cat's ear, it looks like coffee grounds. It's a really um, odd looking kind of discharge. Um, this is what it looks like magnified. And then here, if we are fortunate, 
Um, when you look through the otoscope down into a dog or pr probably most likely a cat's ear, can you see those things moving? They're a little out of focus. Those are mites. And there are that many in the ear canal of dogs and cats that have ear mites. They are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them down there. Um, so they're having a little party in there. So when your dog comes in scratching or especially your cat comes in scratching with mites, you might wonder why they're that uncomfortable because this walking around stuff in your ear canal is pretty miserable. This is video I actually took in a, uh, an exam room with cat a cat. So um, ear mites treatment, you have to treat all the contact animals. You can use milbamycin um, or ivermectin in the ears. Um, anytime you're using ivermectin or selamectin, you wanna be careful in the white-footed dogs, particularly the collies, the shelties, the corgis, um, anything with white feet, because those the border collies, those are all dogs that are ultra, ultra sensitive to ivermectin and selamectin. Um, Revolution, which is selamectin, can be used every two to four weeks for four to eight weeks to get rid of them. Frontline, Brevecto, any of those will work. And any really oily ear medication will suffocate the mites. So Trezoderm, Panalog, any of those are gonna work pretty effectively. And again, remember Advantage, um, Advantix and Simparica are not in breeding animals, although it does do a good job. You don't wanna use that in your breeding animals. Um, for ear mite prevention, basically avoid exposure. So if you have barn cats that have ear mites, don't let your dogs go out and play with them. Skin mites, uh, moving on. Our next ones are gonna be Demodex, Scabies, and Chylediella. Demodex and Scabies live in the hair follicles. Chylediella lives on the surface of the skin, sort of like ear mites live on the surface of the ear. Um, they require skin scrapings to be diagnosed. Uh, we take usually a, a dull scalpel blade, take a scraping across the skin of the dog or the cat where the hair is missing, and then look at it with some oil under the microscope and we will see these little creatures. Demodex, um, like almost all of these, has a life cycle of adult to egg to larva to, to uh, nymph. Um, but like I said, they live deep in the hair follicles. Scabies live also very deep in the hair follicles. And scabies mites are really hard to find on skin scraping. Demodex mites, if you have a dog with demodex, you're gonna find, uh, very easily find those mites. But scabies mites can be very, very difficult to find. Um, and down deep in the hair. So you've got to scrape multiple times down to the point of finding blood. Um, Chylediella lives on the surface of the skin. Again, the same life cycle, adult egg, larva, nymph. Um, so Demodex, typically the importance of this is most of the patients that have large numbers of Demodex in their hair follicles are immunosuppressed in some way, or they have an inherited immunodeficiency, a B cell deficiency. In past years, when I graduated from veterinary school, I remember seeing dogs that died of Demodex. It would become generalized in some patients because their immune system couldn't fight it, and we didn't have any drugs that got rid of it. So now we do have great drugs, so we can very easily eliminate Demodex um, from the dogs as long as the dog is kept on long-term medication. It's not something that you're going to cure, but if the dog is on long-term medication, if they're on Brevecto four doses a year and you've got this under control. My concern is that some of the dogs with Demodex now, we may not even know have Demodex because we're using Brevecto, Simparica, Nexgard, and Cordelia so often that if we have a dog that comes in that might have Demodex or might have scabies and we can't find it, we're gonna put them on one of those four drugs. So we may be masking the fact that some of these dogs have Demodex, have an immune suppression disorder. We may be breeding these dogs unintentionally. So if you suspect that your dog has Demodex, make sure you get a diagnosis before you put that male or female in a breeding program, because we know that some dogs with Demodex, that is an inherited condition. Um, scabies is also called red, red mange, kind of a slang term for it. We can see dogs coming in with their entire coat gone. They are intensely itchy. Um, they can lose all the hair on their entire body. It can be very dramatic, uh, the amount of hair loss that you get with that. And then chylotelia um, is sometimes called walking dandruff, sometimes um, called um, other things, but it's uncomfortable and not nearly as serious as scabies and uh, demodex because it lives on the surface of the skin. But people can develop rashes from scabies or from chylediella. Um, I've actually broken out a couple of times from scabies mites um, and chylediella from handling patients at the office. You'll break out in a small rash. Um, and pretty quickly, I'll be like, okay, who did I handle yesterday that I picked up and carried down the hall under my arm and ended up with a rash? Um, 
So we can see those causing lesions on people, but they typically don't stay on a human for an extended period of time. Human scabies stays on people long-term, but dog scabies will not. Demodex most commonly is seen around the eyes, um, where we see a lot of hair loss and on the feet. Scabies most frequently on the edges of the ears, they get really, really scaly ear edges and elbows. On people, we'll see it on their hand, the webbing of their hand or around their waistband where their um, elastic is. So again, these are distribution things. So if you see it, if I have a dog that comes in that's really itchy and the edges of the ears and the elbows are bad, I'm gonna assume it's scabies unless I prove otherwise. It's that pathognomonic for that kind of condition. Chiletiella can be anywhere on the body. Um, typically, like I said, it's called walking dandruff. So with good magnification and good lighting, you actually see the dandruff moving around. Um, on, they're also called hair clasping mites. There's different terms for these, but they're all mites. Um, diagnosis is with a microscope uh, for demodex and, and scabies requiring a skin scraping, sometimes hard to find. Chiletiella, we just take a piece of scotch tape and stick it onto the um, coat and pick up some of those little pieces of walking dandruff, put it under the microscope and we can see the mites. Um, every now and then I'll find chiletiella on a stool sample because the dog was biting at itself, itchy, uncomfortable, bit the um, hair, swallowed a mite, and then it'll come through on the stool sample. So sometimes we'll find them there too. <laughs> Demodex requires lifetime of treatment for some patients. Scabies and chiletiella are short-term. So if you can get rid of the mites, you've got it taken care of. Again, the same drugs. Revolution, Selamectin, Ivermectin, Revecto, and then scabies you can treat with lime sulfur dip. And we've talked about the not for breeding dogs before. Um, so remember, anytime um, after the first three weeks after breeding, I will use the products, but I try not to do anything during the first three weeks. So what are the other things you need to know about these drugs? Brevecto is the only one of the four oral products that will guarantee flea-free and tick-free for 12 weeks. 38% of the fleas will be dead within two hours of giving the Brevecto pill. 98% will be free, flea-free within 12 hours. And one dose will do the entire 12-week life cycle. The other products, Simperica, Credelio, and NexGuard, and, and Revolution, will require monthly dosing for at least three doses to eliminate the life cycle. Because remember, every one of these lays an egg, hatches out, turns into a nymph, a, a larva, and then a nymph, and then into an adult. So if we're not continuing to treat during that entire life cycle, we're gonna have these parasites coming back. For flea and tick, or for um, heartworm medication, Sentinel Spectrum does a great job on um, flea birth control, intestinal parasites, and um, the, remember the fleas are part of the type worm life cycle. Again, think really hard about what you're using in your breeding animals. Um, the herbal and natural alternatives, again, are not reliable, not safe, not tested to be safe. Um, Trifexis is the only heartworm preventive that we see not being labeled as safe during pregnancy and in breeding animals. Um, but Ceresto, Simperica, Nexgard, Credelio, all of those not tested as being safe. And I have people say to me while well, I use them, like, well, you know, that's probably not a good choice. And I don't want your dog to be the footnote in the paper that it developed some weird condition because of using a product that wasn't labeled as safe in breeding animals. Mm -hmm. So when we have a product that's tested safe, I think we should support the companies that have put the money into researching drugs that can be used safely on breeding animals so that we can rely on those products when we need them. Otherwise, we're going to end up with products that we just don't know what their uses can be or should be. So I think it's important we support those companies that are, that are doing those things for us. So I think that's all we have for the formal presentation. And yeah. now we can go into our Q&A. Absolutely. We've got some great questions here. So we'll try to get through as many of, of these as we can. Um, if we don't get to your question today, we encourage you to call our pet care pros. Um, they work very closely with Dr. Greer. They they have all her knowledge in their brains as well. So um, they'll help answer your question if we don't get it answered here today. But um, Shannon is wondering, is the Lyme disease vaccine safe for breeding dogs? 
The answer is yes, just not during pregnancy. Um, and I try not to vaccinate anything during a heat cycle just in case there is an adverse event. But yes, we do use Lyme disease vaccinations in our breeding animals. Okay. Um, let's see. Our next question comes from Ryan. He's wondering, what are your thoughts on Soresto collars as in the effectiveness or health issues? I think they're very effective, but they are labeled in the European countries for breeding animals. They're not labeled here. It's a good product. Um, I think it's effective. You do have to watch some of the drug interactions with it. So read the label carefully and make sure your dog's not on any of those drugs. But I think it's a good product as long as you're talking about a, a hunting dog, you know, a dog that you're not breeding male or female. Okay. Denali is wondering, does having any of these external parasites affect litters? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, fleas in particular can affect litters. Um, they, they will walk off the mother and onto the puppies. And it doesn't take too many flea bites to cause flea anemia, flea bite anemia in puppies, young puppies and young kittens. So we absolutely wanna make sure that we're not allowing our puppies and kittens to have those parasites. Um, and of course ticks, you know, you don't have to be very old. You can get a tick bite when you're a week old and develop Lyme disease as a baby. So all of those can affect them. We don't see anemia from ticks, but we, well, I guess you could technically if you had enough, but flea bite anemia tends to be the bigger concern in those really young patients. Okay, next question. Brenda is wondering, what's the best way to remove a tick safely that has dug its head into my animal? Sure, so you can use a pair of tweezers and get right down against the skin. Um, the tick key works really well. You slide the tick over or the tick key over the tick and it glides right off. We have a video on our learning center of how that works. Um, so you can use that. Um, there are other products, Tick Twister, some other things. So basically all of these um, products that are meant to remove ticks get down right close to the skin. And then you wanna pull directly out. You don't wanna spin it. You don't wanna squeeze it. You wanna just glide that tick out and it'll bring a little piece of skin along with it. I have yet to see a head of a tick left in a patient, but it, it's always the impression people get because that bite site will stay red and inflamed. You'll feel a lump there for two or three weeks from the amount of saliva and the irritation of the saliva in the in the tick bite. Okay, Marissa is wondering what kind of flea treatment can be given to neonates under five weeks old or given to mom to pass through milk to puppies. She said she's had some pet parents reach out to her that their females had fleas and accidentally gave them to the newborn puppies. Right, and there isn't a product on the market that's labeled safe in those very young patients. If you read all the labels, They'll say at least two pounds, at least four pounds, at least four weeks old. So basically mechanically removing them, meaning you have to shampoo them or comb them um, to just physically remove those fleas. And yeah, it's, it's horrifying. So you need to do good tick control on mom. I don't think enough tick product is going to come through the milk to protect the puppies. But if she's the big target and you've done good tick control with your Brevecto, your Selamectin, your Frontline, um, she's, she's going to have enough product on her and the puppies are going to be moving around on her skin enough that the topicals like frontline will transmit to the puppies. That's one of the reasons things like Vectra with permethrin in it isn't labeled as use for use in nursing dogs is because those products pick up in the oils of the coat and they will transmit across from the mother to the puppies coats. And we just don't have good safety with the permethrin product. So you want to stick to the pyrethrins, you want to stick to the frontline, the, the revolution, selamectin, um, those products for your topicals. Um, lime sulfur dip is pretty safe, really young as well, but it's mostly just physically bathing them with soap and water, combing them out and getting rid of as many fleas as you can. It's it's really awful when you have babies with fleas. It's, it's not fun to deal with. Okay. Julie is uh, has a question about advanced ticks. She's just wondering about, what are your thoughts on that regarding flea control? They're all good products. It's not labeled for use in breeding animals. So does it do a good job? Yes, it does. Should I use it on my pregnant dog, my nursing dog, my male dog that I'm using for breeding? No, you should not. Okay. And Nicole is wondering, is the is the chance of tick exposure increased by feeding your dogs kibble brands that use blood meal as an ingredient? I have never seen anything that said that, so I doubt it. 
because almost everything that you feed, any kind of meat, chicken, pork, beef, those already have blood in them. I mean, they're, they're meat-based products. So I've never seen any indication of that. Okay. Um, some Alexandra is wondering about, again, Sentinel, um, just kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah, Sentinel is a great product. We recommend Sentinel Spectrum in our practice. Um, that is our go-to for flea and tick, or for uh, heartworm preventive and for tick control and uh, tapeworm control. So I really like that product. It does roundworms, hookworms, tape, some of the tapeworms, flea birth control. It's a great all-around product. Okay. Julie's wondering, Brevecto sounds good, but what about the seizure side effects? She said very common in her breed of GSD. Well, every one of the four products has a warning on the label about tremors and seizures. I have yet to see a dog with Brevecto have seizures. Is it reported in the literature? Yes. Can you find information online about it? Sure. But anybody can put anything they want online. I have not seen it. And we've been using Brevecto very extensively in our practice. We have nine doctors all together that work for us. So we dispense a lot of flea and tick and heartworm products. And I have yet to have a dog come in with tremors or seizures on Brevecto. The very first dog I put on Semperica ended up at the ER seizuring. So yes, they're all in the same drug class. Yes, we have to be warned about that. Yes, if you have a seizure sensitive dog, it could trigger something. But I think the risks are very low. And when I look at the risks of Lyme disease, where we see it, not a day goes by in our practice that we don't find at least two dogs with Lyme disease. You know, you have to look at what your trade-offs are. Okay, Julie's wondering, she's used the Soresto collar in the past and she's wondering how long does it take to come out of the system? She says she's now using the Frontline Plus for her right. dog. Probably takes about a month before it gets out of the system. Okay. Um, Kay says, um, Brevecto, she just wants to confirm Brevecto is safe for breeding dogs and for Australian shepherds. She knows the mectin drugs are not correct. It is not an ivermectin type, type drug. And yes, it is safe. And I have given it to my own pregnant dog because we came home one day and found fleas. So my own pregnant dog has received it. So, and I use it on all my dogs. I have a whole bunch of dogs, probably not as many as some of our people, but more than the average pet owner. And everybody at my house gets Brevecto and my dogs are all breeding animals. Uh, Julie's wondering, are you concerned with false positive results from the Lyme's vaccine, the Lyme vaccine? No, most of the tests are now able to distinguish between the vaccination result. Um, when the vaccines first came to market, it was a little bit more blurry, but it's pretty clear now. And the C6, if there is a question, the C6 will clarify that. Okay. Um, somebody's wondering, is canine Advantix okay for mom to use after whelping while nursing in her litter? They nope. said frontline has not always been effective in the spring in our area for ticks. So it is not labeled in breeding and lactating dogs. No. Okay. What would you recommend then in that case, if frontline hasn't been working? Perfecto. Perfecto. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Rhonda's wondering, should you treat a tick site with any kind of antibiotic? Well, you can use an antibiotic cream, and I think that's probably a good idea. Um, there is also some information circulating on the human side, and I am not a physician, so I cannot make physician recommendations, but there is a circulating article uh, from the CDC, I believe, that says if you had a tick bite, you should take a short, very short course of doxycycline. We have not adopted that on the veterinary side, but it is an interesting thought. Um, especially if you live in Wisconsin, where we have, we have like big ticks, like really big ticks. <laughs> That's a very big tick. <laughs> it is a very big tick. <laughs> um, and I know you touched on this, but again, we want to reiterate, um, you, when you say breeding dogs, that means a puppy that is six months old, that is going to be used for breeding. We want, I have a couple of people asking about that. If you could clarify yes. that again. A breeding dog is a dog in your breeding program. If he is six weeks old and he's going to be your next stud dog, if he is six months old, if she is six months old, yes, they are not yet a breeder, 
but a breeding dog is a breeding dog. It's an animal intended to be used for breeding. So if you're planning to breed in the future, if you are actively breeding, if you're between heat cycles and you're not breeding this time, if she's not pregnant right now, if your male dog's not fertilizing females right now, I don't care. A breeding dog is a breeding dog. And I'm not really sure how much more clearly I can say if, if, if the dog is expected to produce a litter, male or female, regardless of their age, if they are actively in a breeding program, going to be bred at some point, I don't care if it's six years later, that's a breeding dog. We don't have data on those. So use the information from the companies that have data showing safety studies are present. Okay. Michael is wondering, what are your recommendations for the safest product for dogs with epilepsy to treat fleas? He says it's a very sensitive dog. Yeah, then I wouldn't do one of the oral medications. So that would take those four orals off the list right away. Um, if it's a breeding animal, I'm assuming if it's a breeding animal, you're probably not breeding a dog that has a form of epilepsy or seizures. So Advantix, Advantage, um, Frontline Plus, Frontline Gold, Revolution. I think probably Revolution is the safest product out there is that kind of a situation. Um, that's probably what I would reach for in an animal like that. Okay. Um, does having any of the external parasites affect pregnant mamas, such as losing a litter? Well, I'm not sure that the flea or tick themselves could cause the loss, but we have seen some really sick dogs with Lyme disease during pregnancy, and we have uh, certainly lost litters to it. So um, pregnancy is an immunosuppressive state. So anytime that you are walking around with Lyme disease sitting, those little spirochetes are sitting in her body, in her bone marrow, wherever they're sitting, and they get reactivated because pregnancy suppressed your immune system. We can see Lyme disease, a recrudescence or a flare up of Lyme disease. And we've had some very, very, very sick females come in during late pregnancy from Lyme disease. Um, we had one that couldn't walk. I thought she was going to die before we got the puppies delivered by C-section. I mean, we can see some really serious stuff. So the external parasite, other than causing anemia, isn't likely to cause disease itself, but the diseases that it transmits, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, ehrlichia, tularemia, you name it, those are all ugly diseases. No one wants those for their pets or themselves. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap this up. So Maria is just wondering, are topical treatments safe on dogs that sleep in bed with owners, especially young children? You know, and that's a really interesting topic. Um, the products do translocate. Um, I am pretty careful in households with small kids because of that. Um, I think of all the products that are out there, Revolution would be the safest. Again, it's an ivermectin product. And although ivermectin products are not used in humans in the United States, they are in other countries for parasite control. Um, the other products that you put on topically that contain permethrins, pyrethrins, those kinds of things, there's always a risk. Um, you know, kids come along and they throw their arms around the dog, give them a big kiss right over their shoulders, right exactly where you put the product. So I'm pretty careful in households with small children. I have two grandsons. I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to the fact that we want to be really careful. So that's where some of those oral products can really shine. Yes, they may have a tendency to cause a seizure prone dog to have a seizure. If they do, then don't give it again. But if you're looking at a product safety um, reason, I, I would avoid the topicals as much as possible in those households. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Greer. So much great information uh, you shared with us today. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great day. Hi, if you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to the Revival Animal Health YouTube channel. If you have a pet health question, call our pet care pros at this number and don't miss our other pet health videos.